Well, yeah. Can digital machine, machines uh, emulate human behavior? Uh, no, not a chance. Why not? Not ever, ever, never, actually. And why is that? Well, because uh, we are not machines and we are not governed by our brains uh, do not work uh, through algorithms and, and we don't work in binary logic. So we have components of our minds that are analog, very important components. And we all know that digital processes cannot, uh, they can approximate, but they cannot emulate uh, analog uh, process, particularly processes like uh, the ones that uh, take uh, place in our minds. Uh, you know, the brain is a very complex system and is uh, formed by 100, 100 billion elements connected to each other, which are continuously adapting to the statistics of the outside world. And this adaptation that we call plasticity um, makes it impossible for a digital machine that needs code to run. So there is no software and hardware in the brain. That's the other thing. It's like an organic computer. Yeah, as an organic computer. Uh, the brain computes with the uh, organic tissue that it, you know, it has. And that, that kind of computation is not reducible to an algorithm. So yeah. there is no singularity coming for the human race. There are other problems that computers can bring to the human race, but not uh, replacing our minds. Because it, it would deny also evolution of the brain. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the brain is a, a system that is a product of an uh, evolutionary process that involved uh, millions of random steps that cannot be simulated in a laboratory or, or in a machine. And my concern is not that computers, digital computers, will reproduce the brain. My main concern is that because the brain is so adaptable, so plastic, and he, and he absorbs everything that is relevant, that uh, gives the brain an uh, evolutionary advantage and a survival advantage, that we may, because we are continuously exposed to computers, digital machines, and now this is exposure is becoming almost overwhelming, that we may start reducing our human condition to mimic machines. And what is going to be rewarded out there is behaviors that are similar to machines. And so the brain would assimilate machines and behave like machines, produce behaviors like machines, eliminating the most important things that define our human condition. Yeah, I understand that. And so, the, when, you, when you look at the brain, because when, when did your fascination for the brain start? Actually, my fascination started when I read a, a science fiction book by Isaac Asimov when I was in high school here in Brazil. And uh, it was a kind of boring book because I like Isaac Asimov for the science fiction books. But then I found this book, The Brain. And it was in a few books that he wrote that is not really science fiction. And it was a description. And in that book, uh, there was no dynamics. There was no physiology. There was mainly anatomy. But I realized that I was, for the first time, introduced to the thing that really creates everything. And, uh, and then when I went to medical school, I started working on computers, uh, microcomputers. They were just coming out in the 80s here in Brazil. And I, and I thought for a moment, OK, I'm going to work on, in applications of computers in medicine, because I liked very much that. And then I said, well, but the ultimate computing device is the brain. And at that time, I didn't really n know much about either computers or the brain. But I decided that I wanted to understand the brain first. And that was 35 years ago. I'm still trying to understand the brain first. Yeah. You know? Because we, uh, first, you, you, you are fascinated by the brain. You are, you are scientifically investigating the brain. Uh, but then the next step comes is you start to understand the brain. Yeah, well, when I c came to neuroscience in uh, 82, 83, uh, Again, there was no dynamics, there was no time in the brain. Most of the descriptions were very static. We talk of maps, columns, areas, sub-areas, circuits, but there was no flow. There was no uh, changing. Uh, plasticity was reported in 83, by my, now uh, one of my heroes and my good friend John Kass and his colleague Mike Merzenich. Two papers that were rejected everywhere, and they only got published in a new journal because people didn't want to see it. The brain, a proof that the adult brain was uh, changing. It was ad adapting to lesions in the periphery. That's how they showed it. And uh, I, I, I wasn't aware of this paper 
and 285. And, but when I saw the paper, you know, uh, two papers actually, I, I started wondering, uh, this, is, this is totally different than what I have been, you know, uh, reading. And that's when I went for my PhD here in Brazil after medical school, and I realized that what I want to look into the brain was the dynamics of the brain, because I had a hint. It was very fade. It was not a very concrete thing. There, uh, there was much more to plasticity than just what uh, John and, and Mike had uh, reported. And it turned out that plasticity is pretty much what matters in the brain. Mm -hmm. It's the central concept of the brain. So I'm, I'm absolutely shocked that these guys have not won a Nobel Prize yet. You know, people have won Nobel Prizes lately for minute, tiny things. These guys discover the essence of what the brain is about, yeah. you know? And when you look, because the, the, when you start to understand the brain, I suppose you, you, you can also understand the immense possibilities when you, when you uh, combine brains, when you think in brains. How, how, how does that work with you? Because you were one of the few experts in this area. Well, uh, you know, I, when I went to the U.S., I met this another phenomenal guy, John Chapin, and we had the same idea. We were one of the few people in the world at that time. Today is common ground, but at that time, in, in fact, people, uh, when they heard what we wanted to do, record from multiple neurons, multiple brain cells simultaneously in behaving animals, so we could look at the dynamics of the circuit, uh, some of our colleagues, more senior colleagues, thought that we are nuts, that we are crazy, that there was no point in moving from recording the electrical signals of one neuron to many neurons. So John and I had a lot of opposition, and our careers were you know, on, on the fringe at that time. And he was an already established uh, guy, but even so, he was young, and I was just a nobody coming from Brazil, you know, a, a postdoc. But it turned out that what we discussed in the early 90s and the studies that we published then, then I think, are now pretty much at the center of neuroscience at the edge. And uh, in almost desperation in 80, 97, we had many papers published, but people are not really pay attention to them. We discussed uh, one day that we needed a preparation, a new preparation to convince our colleagues that uh, this thing that we're talking about, population coding, uh, it was much more relevant than anything that had been done before in terms of single neurons. And that's when we came up with the idea of brain machine interfaces, of linking brains to devices. It was a preparation experimental paradigm that we created to test the notion that to control a device, e either a limb, a real limb, a leg or arm, or an artificial device, the brain requires lots of neurons, not a single cell. And we proved that quantitatively. When you let the animals uh, use only one neuron to control a complex device, no nothing happened. But when you get a population of cells uh, working together, they were able to use just the brain activity to control devices. Yeah, and you did it with rats? With we monkeys? did with rats first. Yeah. The, a year later, we did that was uh, the first paper in brain-machine interfaces in the modern age with the concept. We defined the term. I published a paper in Nature in 2000 that actually started with a description of this goal that you see here to explain what a population code means because this is a goal score in which eight Brazilian players touched the ball without any Italian being able to touch it. And none of the individual players knew the outcome of the play until Carlos Alberto kicked the ball and the goal was scored. So that's what it was trying, the message, the metaphor, was to explain that none of the individual neurons know what is going on. It's the population, it's the team that knows the outcome. And so I started that paper, and in the middle of the paper I said, well, what John and I have proposed a year ago we call it brain-machine interface, and the term was created and there. A year later, we did in monkeys, and uh, in owl monkeys, then in rhesus monkeys, and in 2004, we did the first human demonstration of this concept in an intraoperative procedure in Parkinsonian patients, just for a few minutes. But it was the first human demonstration that everything we had seen in monkeys was applicable. And what was it that you saw then? Well, we saw it was this, this symphony, this neuronal symphony, the properties, that, the dynamic properties that we saw in rats and monkeys were there in humans. It was the same thing. Yeah. And, and, uh, and the same mathematical computational approach that we used to link the brain with a device would work in humans. Mm -hmm. And so that is when we realized that we had something gigantic and that it was not just a basic science uh, apparatus or a paradigm. We had touched something that could uh, have clinical relevance, 
and he could advance neuroscience to uh, realms that we never thought about before. And what, when you look, we are now 2016, 2017, yeah. um, where are we heading for? I don't think anybody can answer that, and nobody can answer that question honestly, because every day things are changing, but uh, it's a completely different neuroscience. It's a completely different brain research. You know, uh, if you look at the Brain Initiative in the United States, that I'm not part of, never got invited to be, uh, everything that the initiative is about is what John and I did. Uh, it's about recording more and more neurons, it's studying only circuits, paying attention about dynamics, plasticity, creating technology to visualize thousands, millions of neurons. However, the emphasis is mainly on technology. And I think that the emphasis should be in the questions. It should be in the real science, you know. Uh, curiosity should be the emphasis, I think. But as you know, technology in the US has become a mantra, almost a religion, to, to the point where some people predict that we will be replaced by technology, which is against the idea that uh, no derivative of a biological system or a, can be more complex than the biological system that created that derivative. Technology is just a projection of our mind. Mm -hmm. It can never be more complex than the mind uh, who created that technology. When you look at this brain project, okay, I can understand that you, want to, don't, you don't want to even be part of it, I can imagine. Yeah. But you, yourself, are developing in, in the neuroscience in, 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 in big steps. Well, can you explain it? Sure. Well, we first started with the brain machine interface concept, right? Mm -hmm. We discovered that we could link brains of uh, rats, uh, monkeys, and humans to an upper limb robotic device that was a physical robot. A seven degree of freedom industrial robot and it worked that was the first thing but then we said why why need to be upper limb why could it be lower limb nobody mm -hmm. went for it. we are the only lab one of the few labs in the world perhaps uh, two or three labs in the world that said okay let's try for legs and it works and so and then we said well why it has to be a robot why cannot be a virtual device can a brain incorporate a virtual device as if it were a part of the subject's body a real you know, flesh and bone, and it worked. We put an avatar of uh, limbs and legs or uh, arms, and the monkeys treated that after a while as if they were a third or a fourth. So we had monkeys with four limbs, two biological and two virtual. Same thing with legs. Then we said, well, the actuator doesn't need to be next to the monkey. So we put an actuator in Japan, a robot in Japan, and we had a monkey in the United States controlling the across the globe, and lo and behold, the monkey assimilated the legs of the robots as if, you know, it, it were uh, their, uh, his own legs. Mm -hmm. And you could stop the treadmill when the monkey was walking at Duke, mm -hmm. and he would still keep imagining movements for the robot to walk in Japan. And as long as you give reward, you know, mm -hmm. monkeys are like us, you know, yeah. they need a, a bribe to, to work. And uh, so as long as you keep giving them juice or, or, or grapes, they would do that. So then we went further and said, uh, why does it need to be just one brain? Uh, could we have multiple brains collaborating mentally to achieve this movement? So that's what we call a brain act. And we just published a year ago uh, showing the three monkeys that don't even know that they are next to each other because in different rooms they don't know the existence of the other guys. They can mentally collaborate to make a virtual arm make certain movements that are, you know, informed to the, to the monkeys uh, how they should do it. And so if you give monkey one the job of controlling the X and Y dimensions of the movement, this is a 3D movement, X, Y, and Z. Monkey one does X and Y, monkey two does Y and Z, and monkey three does uh, X and Z. You need at least two monkeys to get a 3D out of this. But if you get a third guy, it looks much better. The results much better and they can get all reward very quickly and at the same time. Well, the monkeys get together. They synchronize their brains and they work as if uh, they were part of a single brain. In this experiment, I think our colleagues have not seen it. They thought it was just a, some of them thought it was just a trick, just to, you know, some kind of Hollywood kind of thing. It's not. Uh, we actually use that to show how a single brain may synchronize to operate because there's a big mystery. How multiple areas of your brain actually come together mm -hmm. at the precise moment in time to do a job, to make my arms move, to make me speak, to make me reason, nobody knows. 
Nobody knows how this synchronization happens. Well, it turns out that if you put multiple brains separately and you give a common feedback to them, they synchronize. So I think we found a, a very profound uh, rule of when, uh, like, uh, when millions of people are watching TV, the same TV show around a, a country, around the globe, and uh, they all synchronize. And, and when you're in a stadium seeing the same match, the fans there, they all synchronize. So I think we found what is going on, what happens when multiple individuals are recruited to be part of a structure. And that's the reason I'm calling this a structure, being that uh, multiple ants working together, or bees or birds flying together in a flock, fish swimming together, to many humans uh, in a movie theater or in a stadium, I'm calling this an organic computer because it's a synchronized uh, you know, device that is computing in a domain analog that uh, digital computers cannot get there, you know? So that's how we have evolved of this. And of course, uh, five years ago, we decided, okay, there is clinical relevance of this thing. And we may make people benefit from brain-machine interfaces by restoring mobility to them. That's the reason you're seeing this lab here. That's why we, we came to Brazil and decided to do this for the World Cup first, but the project has continued. And our big, biggest discovery with Brain Machine Interface, I think in a decade, um, is that if apparently if you're exposed chronically uh, to a use of a Brain Machine Interface or a, or a paradigm in which you're controlling with your mind something and you're getting rich visual and tactile feedback, you start getting, if you're a paralyzed person with a lesion in the spinal cord, you may start getting recovery of motor and tactile behaviors below the level of the lesion, which has never been demonstrated with other techniques. Yeah. So these are chronic patients, many years after the accident, and yet, uh, in almost 80% of them, after two years, we are seeing that they're recovering control of muscles in the legs. Mm -hmm. They now can feel uh, their bodies below the level of the lesion, uh, and I think it's related to the training that yeah. they were exposed to. Yeah, what I'm saying is, uh, we did uh, create an exoskeleton, a robotic vest controlled by brain activity, and we instrumented this exoskeleton to deliver feedback back to the subject. So the subject, every time he steps on the ground, uh, there are sensors in the surface of the foot of the exo that detect the pressure of the contact. That pressure signal is then delivered to the skin of the arm of the patients because it's one of the few parts of the body where they originally had tactile sensation. And by adapting the parameters of the speed and the magnitude of this pressure wave on the skin, we induced uh, the phenomenon of phantom limb sensation. So we fooled the brain of these guys to feel through their arms their legs. So they report to us that they have, they're walking with their own legs and they're touching the ground. And they can't even tell you what the ground is. You know, they can tell where the ground is grass, where the ground is uh, sand, or if it's a hot asphalt. So these three floors they can distinguish with this system. But then we, we only wanted originally to restore mobility, put them in a device, link the device to their brains and get them to walk again. That was original game. But, one, and, but we always did the neurological examination as a routine, because, you know, and we didn't expect to see any change. Well, six months, a month after the World Cup, six months after the training started, we start seeing that these guys were having motor contractions of muscles below the level of the lesion. And seven of these guys had a complete clinical lesion, which means after 10 years that you shouldn't see anything. You shouldn't see motor contractions, voluntary motor contractions of muscles. They should not have tactile feeling and they should not have visceral uh, feeling. So they, don't, they, they couldn't feel, for instance, the women could not feel when the period days of the month are. Well, we start getting reports from the two women in the, in the project. Look, I, I can feel when my period is coming. I actually can feel that I need to go to the bathroom now. I can, I can control my bladder now. Several of them start telling us. And then when we did the motor test, we measure quantitatively the contraction force. All of a sudden, we had a woman with 20 newtons of force, which is the little kind of force that you need to make to start moving. And we started looking at individual muscles and we could detect the contractions. So we redid the classification, it's called ASIA. ASIA is the American Spinal Cord Injury Classification, it's a standard gold 
gold standard of classifying patients all over the world. These guys were, uh, seven of them were Asia A, which means complete paralysis. And one was Asia B, which is sort of intermediate. Well, in six months, 50% of them were promoted to Asia C, which is partial spinal cord injury. Two years later, uh, we are now talking. Yeah, we are now talking about guys that can. Uh, 217, 216, 215, 2015. Yeah, uh, we started training them in November 2013. Yeah. So six months after that training started, uh, one month after the World Cup, after we lost to the Dutch, and I shouldn't say that on camera and lose my passport, <laughs> but um, uh, it was something in the food, I have to say. <laughs> but in any event, uh, six, one month after the World Cup ended, and we had done our demo which was seen by 1.2 billion people, uh, we redid the neurological test. And long and behold, half of the patients had muscle contractions that they could control. They could actually generate movements that visually, you can see the movements. And when you put them upright, they could simulate walking, you know? And we keep doing it. We keep doing the training. Now, uh, this December, we completed two years of training we redid the neurological exam, and now 78% uh, of the patients have recovered uh, movement. So uh, six out of eight have muscle control below the level. It's not complete, but it's something that has never been seen. So the hypothesis that we have based on studies that were forgotten in the 60s and 70s, uh, an Australian uh, and a, and a pathologist had done a lot of autopsies in uh, Australian spinal cord injury patients that died of natural causes. And he, sh he realized that in about 60% of the patients that are classified clinically as being complete paralyzed, there is at least 2 to 20% of fibers, of nerves in the spinal cord that are still connected. They're not totally destroyed, but they're quiet, very likely. They went blank. I think our training, now when I read this paper, I'm, my hypothesis is that the training, the intensive training that we did with brain-machine interface with the patients, turn on neurons again in the brain, and these neurons start sending messages down to the spinal cord through these axons that were quiet, but they're still there. So it's plasticity. It's what John Kaz and Mike Merzenich predicted. Yeah. So what would that mean when you, when, you, when you think through that and look at the future? Oh, what, a, what, what are possibilities? The possibilities are, are tremendous, you know, because there are 25 million people in this condition, spinal cord injury paralysis, in the world. Imagine now if a, a large percentage of them can recover some movement, some control, because, for instance, one of our uh, patients, one of the women in the group, since now she had perineal sensation, she decided to become pregnant, and she actually could feel the delivery. You know, uh, she had bladder control, so she went to work. Uh, two of our patients got jobs because they now could get out of the house. They didn't need to wear diapers anymore to, you know. We don't think about it. We had one patient that was hypertense. He's normal tense now because the cardiovascular system performs better when we are upright. And since he's one hour a day, two days a week is enough for the cardiovascular system to recover the blood vessels to open up. So his blood pressure went down. So being up and walking is a major behavior for we humans. And you know, these guys lost weight. Yeah. Some of them were overweight because of being in a wheelchair too long, a decade or so. And, and when you look further, because that's very important, I understand it, and, and it's a major, yeah. major breakthrough. But when you look further, when you are able to understand the brain, connect brains, uh, uh, what kind of what, what holds the future for us? Oh, there are many things. I mean, you saw the prototype of our uh, brain net for humans. So we are about to get uh, a patient, a naive patient that hasn't been trained yet in our paradigm, which takes some weeks. But we want to reduce this training time because the beginning of the training is very difficult. The patient has to really concentrate and in the beginning it's a little frustrating because the brain has forgotten what is to walk. Actually, the brain has forgotten what is the concept of having lower limbs. So through virtual reality training, we need to reintroduce to the brain the concept, oh yeah, you have legs. This body has legs and they move. And we do that by having the patient trying to control uh, avatar of himself or herself walking on a virtual space. And it takes many weeks for the patients to get this done. Well, we are going to start linking 
the brain of this patient in a non-invasive way with EEG, as you saw, with a physical therapist that is really well trained in that task, a normal person with now, uh, I wouldn't say normal, but a person that can walk by, by herself. And we are going to link the brains and in the beginning of the training, 90% or 95% of the signal comes from the healthy uh, physical therapist and five or 10% comes from the patient who has a spinal cord injury. So he's going to, his brain is going to get rewarded faster and he's going to have the impression that he's controlling the device. And I think that motivation, the context, is a driving force for plasticity. My prediction is that we are going to accelerate the learning curve because we are going to accelerate plasticity. So the brain net is going to have a very practical clinical application almost instantaneously. But then also you can use it for different things. You can start steering things in the world just by thinking. It's, yes, the problem is that the non-invasive technology that we use, EEG, the mm -hmm. one that you, know, you just put in this, it doesn't have the same resolution and the same information content. It's not as rich in information. We need to play some mathematical tricks to get information out of that signal. So it's not as rich as in, implanting things in the head. So I'm not suggesting that we implant people in the head just to, so they play video games. But yes, it's a, it's a proof of concept the mental collaboration, if we get better non-invasive techniques in the future that can portable, I mean, EEG now is wireless. As you saw, you know, you can have uh, wireless broadcasting. Uh, we have a paper coming this week, although that uses uh, invasive technology in, in monkeys, showing that monkeys can learn to drive wheelchairs in an open space in our lab uh, mentally. So you see a monkey sitting on the wheelchair and she's driving or he's driving uh, the wheelchair to the pod where we're delivering grapes. But every movement of the wheelchair is coming from the mind of, of the, the monkey via a wireless link. So it's 500 neurons firing wirelessly, uh, broadcasting the signal wirelessly so the motors of the wheelchair turn and round and go out to the pod. But then in that case you can also connect several brains yes. by the Yes, we already have an experiment in the lab where two monkeys are collaborating. Two, each monkey has its own wheelchair and they only get rewarded if both of them get to the pod. So the faster monkey helps the slower monkey to get you know, uh, uh, themselves together at the pod at the same time. So we are already showing the brain net working between two monkeys. Yeah, but not between humans. No, no, in humans we are using for clinical rehab yeah. at this point. Um, but it's, yes, it's conceivable that if we improve the bandwidth and if we improve the uh, how methods to extract information from, this, uh, from the brain in a non-invasive way, you could have over the internet uh, millions of people collaborating on a common task. So, how does the future of your neuroscientific work look like and the effects of it? Uh, yeah, well, that's a very good question. I think that in one direction, we are going to increase the clinical applications because what we saw for spinal cord injury, I, I think, may be applicable to stroke victims, it may be applicable to other neurological disorders that require plasticity. And in fact, I have a theory that I'm uh, about to publish and I'm going to put in my new book of that most neurological and psychiatric disorders, independently of their etiology or the cause of this disease, uh, let's say Parkinson's disease. We know that you, you develop Parkinson if you're, the cells that contain a particular chemical, dopamine, start dying, okay? But once they start dying, what we discover in, in animals and then in humans is that the lack of dopamine produces like a, a epileptic seizure, a low level chronic seizure, and that explains the tremor and the difficulty to move. Well, we discovered that if we put a microchip in the spinal cord, and send electrical pulses at a right frequency, tiny electrical pulses, but a very high frequency, we disrupt the seizure, and the animals and the patients seem to get better. So I think this kind of concept that neurological disorders are disorders of neuronal timing, how they fire together. If they fire too much, it's not good uh, together. So I think that I'm going to, in one part of my work, uh, in, increase the scope of uh, use of brain machine interfaces to treat neurological disorders, that's one. From a basic science point of view, I have two other uh, branches. One is to push very hard to understand the kind of computation that the brain does that is different from digital machines. So I'm building models, analog models of the brain, uh, to uh, particularly studying more detail the interaction of the brain magnetic fields with the uh, neurons 
and see if this analog digital interaction, this, uh, what I like to say, uh, a recursive analog digital interaction explains why the brain is different from a digital machine. That's one line of work. And the other is to continue to push the envelope on trying to see how large circuits uh, in behaving animals operate. So uh, our lab is now, has now the world record in number of neurons uh, recorded simultaneously. Uh, we're getting close to 2,000 neurons now. Uh, but I think we need to increase this to about 100,000 to a million to start getting close to a picture. It's like when you do a camera, a movie, and you have just a few pixels of the image, you cannot see very well, but if you increase the number of pixels, you start seeing the granularity, you start seeing more and more of the image, but you not necessarily need to have all the pixels of the, of the photograph or the movie to see what is going on. So I think if we cross the barrier of a million uh, neurons recorded simultaneously, we are going to see a lot of the movie that goes on in the brain. Recording simultaneously. Recording simultaneously, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. And the, um, uh, let me one, one second. Um, uh, can you take me through the steps in this lab we filmed yesterday? Sure. Right? Yeah. We, we, are, we are filming three You're different filming, steps. Yeah. What you're filming in reality is a simulation of the five different steps that our patients uh, uh, undergo when they do the training. Okay? So they first, as I said, they need to, we need to reinsert in the brain the concept of having legs. So that's basically what we do. Uh, we put them in a virtual reality environment that you're going to see in a moment, and the patients start interacting with the avatar. And we, now we are very, you know, we started just with the global concept of walking, but now we are actually simulating control of specific muscles of walking, which we never thought these patients would be able to do with their brains. They're getting specialized in controlling individual legs, with one side of the brain, for instance, the right side controlling the left, left leg, left side controlling the right leg. But we discovered that we can uh, do a physical therapy by simulating muscle contractions on the video, so they see a muscle of the leg contracting, and we develop the ability to contract individual muscles, which is, we never thought that would happen. So that's the first step, is the virtual reality. Then they go to the robotic device. The robot is standing on the treadmill to learn what is to be inside of a robot, because you should not underestimate how different it is to be encased in a robotic device. It's a completely different feeling of what you are. And since we are providing tactile feedback, they are getting tactile feedback from their legs inside of that uh, standalone robot. So that takes several months of uh, feeling at ease, uh, normal. So then uh, we have an intermediate step where they go and, and stay in this system that we call zero, gra uh, zero gravity, or zero G, where they are upright without a robot and they are practicing with just to be upright and, and trying to move with some orthosis that we, we fabricate and we give to them to practice because they're going to be in an exoskeleton. Uh, we have another step that is uh, just a a mix of virtual reality and the standalone robot, and finally, they get into the exoskeleton, just at the end of the process. And it takes you know a few months for them to get to that point. And in the exoskeleton, they now are using everything they learned in the previous steps to con use the brain activity to control, to trigger the movements of the exoskeleton. Now they can trigger individual legs, and they are getting the feedback from the feet as they walk on the ground. And sometimes they walk on the ground just looking at a mirror to see their bodies walking upright because that helps shape the brain's image of the body. Sometimes they have goggles because they walk in a virtual reality environment even though they are uh, in an exoskeleton. And sometimes they were just walking, uh, you know, doing about 50 some steps back and forth in this uh, laboratory by, space. By thinking. Exactly. By thinking, oh yes. And, uh, and that's exactly what we did. This is the third prototype that we have. Uh, the, the first prototype was used during the demo of the World Cup. Uh, but of course, uh, we had to struggle with FIFA, you know, because FIFA never gave us the conditions to actually do what we wanted, you know, and I don't need to go into the details, but 
from a three minute demo, we are down to 29 seconds, and, and which is almost virtually impossible to do a robotic demonstration. But what's important in that is that Giuliano Pinto, the guy who actually delivered the opening kick of the World Cup, he trained on the pitch, on the grass, for days, and he delivered 57 kicks. In his exoskeleton? In the exoskeleton, he had 57 attempts, and he got 56 correct, which show you know, that we are in the right direction, that people can get used to these devices, and they can actually start performing at a very high level of accuracy. And of course, we just started slow, just with walking straight. Now we are going to think about, uh, we are already planning uh, turns and other movements that the patients want to have, but we are learning very quickly now. So the beginning was very difficult because some of these patients that you saw uh, were in a wheelchair for a decade with no hope of nothing. And, and I can show you some of the movies that they have of the movements that they can make now. You will be shocked. What a paralyzed but by using their brain. Yeah. No, and no, no. I'm I'm talking about their own movement yeah. movements without the exo. When you put them up now in the zero G again, and you in the beginning you put them up and say move, and nothing would happen. They would stand and nothing would happen. Yeah. Now you put them in here, and some of these patients can actually you see them doing this with their own legs, yeah. suggesting that we reconnected yeah. uh, the brain to the spinal yeah. cord. You know, the, not reconnected uh, anatomically. Anatomically, there were some nerves that survived there probably. We reconnected it functionally. The brain can send a message and the message is getting to the muscle somehow. Yeah. And when you look um, outside the lab to the world, I, I really like the way that you, how you look at the world and materialize your knowledge of the, and your love for the brain in painting, in writing, in, looking at soccer, how, how, how do you see that? Yeah, well, this is something that happened the last five years or so. You know, what I, I thought, you know, that my six years, my study of neuroscience was too limited to what most neuroscientists do, electrical signals of the brain, computational strategies and behavior. And then I start thinking deeply, with, you know, with the help of my good friend, uh, Ronald Sicurel, with a, a retired uh, mathematician and now a philosopher in Switzerland. And I just came to a realization one day in Montreal when, when I visit him, where we do our work together, I, uh, walking, that actually, when we talk about the brain, uh, we should not be limited to the kind of neurophysiological, neuroanatomical, or neurolingo that neuroscientists talk about. Suddenly I realized that the brain is the center of the human cosmology. The brain is the cr true creator of everything. And I start thinking about the, the whole universe as just raw information, uh, like an empty canvas, and the brain as the true painter, the human brain. So I don't know if there are other brains out there, but everything that we have, the history of the planet, the history of the cosmos, uh, the history of the human race, uh, the ev theory of evolution, everything that we, we have conceived since the first human came out of the trees and started walking. If you could somehow sum the amount of information and knowledge processed by every single human brain that ever existed or exists or will exist, that's the universe. That's the human universe. And I start thinking about a, a, a changing viewpoint. So first we thought that the earth was the center of the universe. Then we thought it was the sun. And then we thought it was the Milky Way. But then we thought, no, 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 the center of the universe is the Big Bang, where everything came. Of course, there was something like the Big Bang, there must have been. I actually start thinking that the center of the universe, at least for our ref reference, is our mind, is the human brain. And I start thinking about everything around us as information, as raw information. And information that to get any meaning, to get any, any description needs a brain. And it so happens that the only one that we know is the human brain. So I have a theoretical experiment with Ronald that if some other life form, intelligent life form, would come in contact with us and we actually could talk to or communicate somehow, that life form, assuming it had a brain that evolved through completely different laws of evolution in a different environment, would tell us a story of the cosmos that is not necessarily ours and a completely different cosmology would be confronted with ours. 
So I actually think the neuroscience in this century may give us a hope to bring humanity, the human condition, to the center of our lives in opposition, not in opposition, but to balance another movement that exists in the world right now that seems to say that technology may be able to solve everything. That technology may be able to educate our kids, take care of the elderly, uh, run our airports, run our uh, universities, run our knowledge gathering, and eventually, uh, uh, you know, some loonies say, uh, may replace us. And I think this is crazy. This is insane. Technology is a projection of a much more complex thing called the brain. When we create a machine like this, or create a, a car, a plane, a computer, or a robot, we are just projecting our abstraction to a, a tangible device that is infinitively less complicated than the creator. So the creator is the mind, and the human mind. And that's the reason I start thinking and I'm not talking about philosophy. I'm not a philosopher. I know nothing about philosophy. I'm talking about as a neuroscientist, trying to use what I know about the brain to actually say that the brain has a point of view. The brain is not a passive decoder of the environment. The brain shaped through evolution, was shaped through evolution by the environment, by our genes, by you know, mutations and everything. But as we are born and we grow in the early phases of our lives, we start developing a model of reality and an interpretation of reality, and we start painting this uh, empty canvas, uh, and we, we give a meaning to it, and we create a story, uh, and we create history too, you know? And that's a much more profound, in my opinion, view of the brain and the role of neuroscience than we thought before. And it changes, I think, the balance. If we, we believe in this, the human condition becomes a much more precious, much more, you know, a, a, a single life becomes much more precious than we thought before because the epic of a single life, first of all, cannot be reproduced ever and it will never happen again. It's like a book that will never be written again. And I think it gives us a little more uh, recognition as, as human beings than Currently, I see the, go, the world going on, you know? And if I can, just to finish, uh, if you read the Iliad or the Odyssey, mm -hmm. uh, which I consider the pinnacle of human condition, you know, a description of the human condition, when a soldier, a Greek soldier, would die in Troy uh, in a battle, Homer describes who he was, who were the parents, who are the children that he's living, what is the whole history of that individual that will never be recovered? So compare that to the news of a death in a newspaper today, which is just a number, nothing. Homer, you know, God forbid, uh, 3,000 years ago, uh, knew better what the human condition is than we probably know now. We are losing that. And I think that process of losing it is part of our brains thinking that is really nice and good and is worth it to mimic computers instead of maintaining our integrity, our human condition integrity. So, um, in, in your neuro, neuroscientific field, uh, with several neuro, neuroscientists yes. working, are you unique in this? Uh, in, in no. Looking at, uh, in, in terms of the way I look at the brain? Yeah. No, no, I think there are many people. Yeah. Many people that, uh, of course, there are nuances. You know, yeah. it's, a, it's a big field and the brain is very complicated and the subtleties uh, from a, you know, neurophysiological point of view and, you know, for instance, people believe that we should go deeper into the molecular structure of the brain. I, th I find this fine from an intellectual point of view, of course, studying individual synapses and everything. I just don't think any of this will allow us to explain how the, the system works. The system is, is extremely nonlinear, and you, if you start studying just a molecule, you're not going to be able to track it back to the system. It's going to be impossible, the number of nonlinearities that you have to face. So, but there are many people that are realizing what we are discussing this now. Uh, it's not just, the, I would say, honestly, that is not the mainstream yet, but neither was population coding 30 years ago when I started. Yeah. People gave me no hope of having a career in studying populations of neurons. And here I am, 
you know. Uh, so I'm I'm used to the idea that you may start with notions and concepts that are not mainstream, and you need to demonstrate that they're worth. That's part of what science is about. The problem is science has become extremely conservative, and it's very difficult to break through with new ideas. Much more difficult than when I started when I was a kid. Uh, but you know we are stubborn. Yeah, and where are you standing in? F f your, where is your work standing in five years when you look at the future of your neuroscientific field? Well, I think as you can see here, this is growing very quickly. The clinical applications, I think, are going to grow tremendously. Uh, I think the basic science is going to evolve, in the sense that we are going to. Uh, I mean, we are accelerating the curve of the number of neurons that we can record simultaneously. It used to be a very flat, uh, straight line. It took us 30 years to get to 1,000, 2,000, but now things are accelerating because we are learning better ways to do this. Um, my ambition to the end of my life is to be able to actually formulate this theory of, of uh, you know, a, a comprehensive theory of, of the mind, of the brain, the way we, we talked just a minute ago. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm spending a lot of time writing and reading, you know, I'm, I'm reading literature on communication. Uh, Marshall McCollum, for instance, I became fascinated by what he used to say in the 60s and 70s about the media being the message and how, uh, you know, the, uh, communication has changed our nature and from the moving from the oral tradition of poetry of the Greeks to written manuscripts, then to the print, to the radio, telegraph, Telegraph, the radio, TV, uh, internet. I think that actually, he got it. Uh, he didn't know anything about the brain. But some of his writings uh, in the 60s and 70s actually got how relevant communication is to synchronize brains. And and, I understand that. And the, the human brain net, is that going to be a fact? Well, uh, we're doing, an, a, as a clinical application, that's what we're doing right now. And I want to see how that goes first. I want to see if these are advantageous to the patients, because that's a very concrete and tangible problem to improve training. Particularly, if, suppose you have an aphasic patient, a patient that suffers stroke, that destroys the left side of the brain, the cortex, and he cannot talk, but the right hemisphere is, is there, and there is some language capability left on the right hemisphere. Suppose you can connect this guy with someone else who can speak, and you can synthesize voice by having a brain net work with that stroke patient. Maybe you can improve the training of the right hemisphere by plasticity because we know it happens, even in an adult patient. If you didn't have any lesion on this side, just this, you may try to improve the language uh, skills of the right hemisphere. So that's another thing that I want to start soon because there's, uh, there are 10 times more stroke victims in the world than a spinal cord injury victims. So we were talking about a quarter of a billion people in the world with stroke uh, 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 consequences, you know? So, so when you develop what you're doing, the way you can see that, that more and more you can have uh, parts of the brain that, that people for some reason can't use or is, is almost dead, Yeah. you can reactivate it either by somebody else. Exactly. Either by combining their brains with someone else, suppose you're your sibling, you know, uh, your wife or your daughter or your son help you in the training. And eventually it becomes a surrogate. You know, you can talk through this combination or you can communicate because there are lots of patients also that become totally detached from the world. They are conscious, their brains are working, so they, they are absolutely conscious. But for instance, all the muscles, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS, all the muscles of the body are paralyzed, so they cannot blink, they cannot talk, they cannot breathe, but they're conscious, and their brain is fine. The central part of the brain is totally fine, and these patients can barely communicate. Uh, there is a brain-machine interface for those patients that my friend uh, in Germany, in Tübingen, Niels Birbaumer, created. By the same time that we were doing experiments with rats, we didn't even know each other at that time. Uh, that works, but it's phenomenal, and Niels is a hero for this community. Uh, but it can be improved, and, and things can be better, yeah. and faster. Uh, so I think that's what we can go. Yeah, and the um, uh, when you look at the brain, at the, the, the importance of creativity and intuition. Yeah, and that's that's one of my concerns. Uh, computers are not creative. 
Computers don't generate knowledge, we do. We get raw information and combine in ways that cannot be predicted, you know, and that's the reason, I, I, as we talked before, I like painting, because painters, uh, I, I love the, when they asked Picasso what the painting meant, one of particular paintings that he had that day, and Picasso said, well, if I knew, I would not have painted. And it's, this is it, this is deeper than probably he meant uh, for me as a neuroscientist, because it's true. I think it's a, since painting is more of an analog description of what we are thinking and uh, what we are feeling, uh, this is a projection to the outside world uh, of some internal state of the mind. And, and that's why I think this transition uh, that we discussed, uh, the Impressionists and then modern art, it was an explosion of form. Form disappeared. You know, why are the old guys tended to be very careful about reproducing every corner, every shadow of a scene, of a person, or, you know, uh, modern art removed the concept of shape from painting and sculpturing because it didn't matter anymore. There was an ex a completely different expression, surrealism, you know, cubism. This is, this is totally linked to the, my view of the brain in the sense of trying to project what is inside rather than taking a shot of what is out there. Mm -hmm. And photography, of course, uh, got these guys out of business, the guys who painted everything very, you know, just us poor amateurs like to still paint these things. Yeah. But um, art, you talk about creativity, art, uh, my concern is that if we become uh, just computers, art will disappear. Computers don't do art. They try to mimic, they can compose artificial music, they can do some text, but they don't carry the human condition in those letters and those brushes, you know? We do. And I, I fear that uh, a complete re total allegiance and reliance on technology may destroy the human capability of being creative, yeah. of doing art, of doing the unexpected, you know? And the unconscious way of brains working together, like in soccer or... Uh... Well, uh, when you saw the soccer fans in the stadium, I, I think they are, I, I created this, this metaphor and this operational definition of an organic computer. Organic computer is basically multiple brains that get synchronized in nature by whatever signal, visual, tactile, auditory, that makes them operate as a whole. So the flock of birds is my best uh, and a metaphor uh, or a school of fish. Uh, the flock, if you look at the flock, is very interesting because uh, you are minimizing the chances of each individual to be attacked by a predator. But, you know, the, the birds change position in the flock. Sometimes they have to go to the front and break the air. They get tired. They move to the internal center of the flock where they are most protected because they are tired. And, but there are birds that have to fly on the edge. And at the edge, they are more vulnerable, but they are always rotating. So there's, an in, there's dynamics in this thing that it seems to be minimizing the chances of being caught. If you're flying by yourself, a falcon may get you, you know, an eagle may get you much easier. And as a flock, they, they, they are going to get to a source of food and they may get there easier than uh, just the individual birds looking, you know. Yeah. Uh, so birds and fish uh, have memory like we do. So Miguel, tell me about your brain projects in Natal. Well, uh, Natal is a completely different thing. It's a parallel track of my life, you know, that is started in 2002, end of 2002, beginning of 2003, when President Lula was elected here in Brazil. I was already for a long time in the United States, in uh, 14 years already in the United States, and I saw an opportunity to actually return to Brazil and do something, not just to do science in Brazil, but to use science as a completely different thing, as an agent of social development in a part of Brazil that is well known for Brazilians as being the most underdeveloped part of the country, in the northeast of the country. And I wanted to prove that human talent is everywhere, that you could go and just, you know, drop uh, from parachute in a, in a place and start creating scientific infrastructure and invest in high-level education in a way that would transform the social reality of that community. So I chose a small town in the outskirts of the capital of the Rio Grande do Norte state, and the capital is Natal, 
Uh, but the, the city is actually named Macaiba. It's, a, it's the name of a palm tree that is typical of the region. And it had 65 inhabitants. And the worst, uh, you know, human development index is in, in the state of Rio Grande do Norte and one of the worst in the country. And what we did was to go there and create, in parallel to an institute to do neuroscience, like any institute, to use the knowledge that we have as neuroscientists to design an education program that actually starts on the prenatal uh, care of the mothers of our future students. So we, because a human mortality or um, women mortality rate was very high, particularly pregnant women mortality rate. So at that time, about 90 women per 100,000 deliveries would die. So very high, 30, 20, 30 times higher than the, you know, you, know, you should have normally. Uh, we create a, a, a clinic, a women's clinic to f oversee the prenatal care of all the women in the region. And uh, to give an idea, uh, we started from nothing. Now we are doing 12,000 appointments a year. And we have done already 60,000 appointments since we started, which, is, which means that pretty much every woman in that city that got pregnant in the last six, seven years have gone through our prenatal care system. It's all free of charge, it's all public, and it's the best prenatal care you can get, that medicine can offer. Because as neuroscientists, we knew that if you don't uh, provide the best possible prenatal care, any problems that a child will have during pregnancy cannot be fixed. It's very difficult, it's almost impossible right now. Any learning disability or any other malformation of the brain, it will not be corrected. So how could you have a neuroscience-based education program that doesn't offer these students a chance to be born with the highest possible uh, neurobiological potential to achieve happiness? Because that's my definition of education, is a pathway to happiness. So we created this education program that starts in the prenatal care, and then we start uh, enrolling 1,500 kids a year to three schools that we created, two in that state and one in another state, in Bahia, uh, where the kids go in one part of the day to uh, public school, which in Brazil is not full-time, uh, it's just four or five hours a day. But on the other period of the day, they would come to our schools. And our schools in Macaíba, Natal, and in Serrinha, in Bahia, are all lab science oriented. Even to learn Portuguese, you learn in a lab. And we basically make these guys, these students from, at that time, from um, 10 to 15 years old. And uh, when we open our new school in the campus of the brain that we are building, it's 100 hectares campus in that region, it's taking us seven years to finish that. Um, the school is going to be from zero to 17. So from the moment they're born, to the, they can go to the nursery, to the moment they finish high school, they're going to be in our school if they want, about 3,000 kids total. And then we are going to have an undergrad program in the campus for kids that want to pursue a scientific career, a master's, a PhD, and postdoctoral training. So we're going to have a program that means that a kid can be there for 30 years if they want. But in the case of this uh, science education program that we created on the opposite period of the day from public school, uh, these kids became protagonists in their own education. They basically got involved in learning as a, as a pleasant experience. For, and they develop a ethics of learning that we never saw in their region and in most parts of Brazil because they don't go to our schools because they have to. They go because they want to. And that school became a school not only for science, but for developing citizens. Citizens, they are fully aware of their rights, fully aware of their responsibility in society, and fully aware that science and knowledge can be the passports for their happiness, for their further uh, education. And this thing multiplied to a point that we have already 11,000 kids that have gone through this schooling system. And for the first time in that place history, Macaiba and the neighborhoods next to it, these kids are gaining access to the best universities in Brazil in their region, public universities, where they could never make it, because they never could pass the admissions exam. Even though our schools don't have exams, we don't do tests, we don't believe in tests, we don't believe in the Anglo-Saxon punitive way of teaching, we believe in the Finnish way. Without knowing, we have replicated uh, the Finnish approach to education in Brazil without knowing until very recently that there were very similar parallels with one 
caveat that the Finnish have not uh, learned yet. We do the education since the prenatal care. So, and now the women are our partners too. You know, that we created a community uh, that is very supportive of everything we do because different from most universities in the world, they really are these beautiful paradises of knowledge, but the surrounding parts of the university have nothing to do with the university and have no idea what is going on inside the doors. I see that particularly you know, in the United States and even here in Brazil. We create a, a campus that has no walls. It's totally porous to the community. And the community has learned the value of science. Because science is not for papers, books, publications, and acquisition of knowledge. Science in Natal, in Macaiba, we demonstrated that science can also be an agent of social and economic transformation. Because in addition to promoting education and women's health, we have created a whole cascade of jobs, an entire production line of uh, support, uh, suppliers, people that make uh, construction work because we are building a campus. So the, it's very nice to see the fathers of our children building this campus. They, they, they work for the construction company that has built uh, the first two buildings. They're, they're gigantic buildings. They're 12,000 square uh, meter um, research institute, and then they're 12,000 square meter um, school. Very good. Great impressive. I think when, when I hear you, I think dreaming is very important oh, yeah. for science. And oh, I, 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 the subtitle of my new book about uh, the Natal, the Macaiba project, is uh, How to Build a Utopia, a Scientific Social Utopia. Because, you know, in our days, utopia has become almost like a curse word, a negative word. And I, 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 I disagree frontally with that. I think we have to have utopias and dreams. Even if we don't fulfill them completely, it's very important to be engaged in one because of the process makes us want to get out of house, our house and go out here in this pretty tough, cruel world and actually do something concrete. And in Natal, uh, I think uh, that's what happened. We had Brazilians coming from all over the country, teachers, scientists, uh, physicians, administrators, technicians, uh, who believed in this utopia and now they can put their hands on these walls and they can see these kids getting to the university and so it's, it's a very rewarding experience. In fact, it's one of the things that when I go to Natal, uh, you know, I feel the real meaning of science. Uh, when I look at here in these patients and I go to Natal, I actually feel that was worth it, you know, these 35 years of work. Yeah. But in neuroscience you also need dreaming. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we need dreaming for a variety of reasons, but uh, in neuroscience, yes. I think if you if we equate, as we discussed before, if we equate neuroscience or any science just with technology development, you're missing the most important part of it. Is this dreaming? Is this creativity? Is trying to answer questions that nobody has ever asked or nobody ever had an answer for? And uh, so the first time that John Chapin and I recorded. 26 neurons simultaneously in a little rat in our labs in the middle of the night. First he told me that there was a good thing we could share a lawyer for our divorces because you know we're there at five in the morning recording a rat brain and our wives will never believe that we're actually doing it. But the second thing we thought, both of us in Philadelphia in 91, was this is going to change everything. And nobody knew, but we knew. We were the first ones to see those 26 neurons firing together. And it may sound little, but for us, that was the universe. You know, that was the thing that changed our lives. You, know? uh, you said, you, you were talking about technology being uh, people that only believe in technology yeah. for a solution. Uh, in, that's, in that sense, I was thinking of Silicon Valley. How do you see well, that? Well, yeah, I think these guys live in a bubble. You know, they're very interesting things they have created. And they're very interesting that have changed the world that have created, but uh, they're not the gods of the universe that they think they are. And there are a lot of hubris and arrogance there too. You know, there's a very a lot of talent people and a lot of very gifted people. But uh, you just need to go to San Francisco and ask the opinions of people that, uh, who live in San Francisco before this thing exploded, Silicon Valley, and what is going on there. Because a lot of people there believe the technology will solve all our problems, and that's not true. Our problems will be solved by the good old-fashioned way of humans interacting and trying to find a consensus to live together, to democracy, to, to uh, political engagement, to social engagement, to recognizing that not everybody is born 
uh, you know, with the same opportunities and we need to uh, increase the opportunities to everybody and try to look for a way to, so everybody can seek happiness and achieve it, a good amount of it, not perhaps everything, but a good amount of it that is, uh, makes life decent for everybody. And to believe that we're going to solve all the problems of the universe through Facebook, Twitter, or to robots or artificial intelligence is ludicrous. Is in fact, uh, in my opinion, uh, a new wave of capitalism where you need to, you, you have to reduce the human value, you have to devalue the human contribution uh, because then if you reduce human cost of labor, you increase profits to infinity. That's a very well-known equation. And uh, you cannot eliminate uh, human value, uh, it's obvious. You know, and, and, but so in some senses, um, in a very main sense, some of the prophecies that these gurus uh, like Carswell and others have made that we are going to be replaced are not only foolish and not based on any scientific data, they're dangerous in my opinion. They actually confront us with the fact that there has to be an answer to that. And the answer is that we are humans and uh, our uh, most value, uh, most precious capabilities are not out there for a digital computer to replace. So it's, it's neglecting the value of the brain. It's neglecting the value of the human species, in my opinion. And um, millions and millions, uh, billions of years of evolution that took us from uh, a piece of rock or stardust to a, a thinking, creative, non-conformist human brain uh, and is destroying uh, the fabric of humanity in my opinion. Uh, so we need to be aware of it and, and confront these guys. Well, that's a good ending, I think. Well, in yeah? Uh, 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 but maybe it's a bit off track, but I was... So most, uh, most of the time when you interview uh, like brain specialists or, or like... Uh, uh, it, it's very brainy. <laughs> yeah. But when you when we look around here, all the metaphors, so to speak, or or what we see, is actually very corporeal, very with the body, very connected to movement, and and so it's not uh, even when you say like the brain is the center of the universe, it's so much uh, acted out through all these. Yeah. Well, that's the difference of a technician and a scientist. My professor here in Brazil, which was the father of neuroscience in Brazil, Cesar Timoyeria, always told me there's a big difference between a technician and a scientist. A technician builds gizmos and runs things like a robot. A scientist thinks like a human and thinks about science in broader terms than just a specific field or a specific um, area of his or her work. I think we scientists almost need, by, by, de by default, to have a very profound and deep intellectual background. And we need to think about the consequences of what we do, you know, the legacy of what we do and the way our science is used. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but there's a very new danger of weaponizing the brain. And I'm totally opposed to it because this is the last frontier. And I don't want to see what I did, what I created, called brain-machine interfaces, being used to harm or, or kill people. Uh, so uh, this, what, what way would, would well, you, you can imagine, and this is happening now in some places, particularly in the United States, where the Department of Defense is thinking about using brain-machine interfaces to create weapons, you know, that humans can control just by thinking. And I frontally oppose this, and I think it's important that neuroscientists uh, speak out, you know, against this kind of use of this research. That's a good question, your, 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 your good statement you're saying, because that is true, that the, the moment you you, you cross the border of knowledge again, it yes. can be used. Yeah, and, and well. our, our only hope is society. Because we scientists push the envelope to discover what is possible, but it's society's duty and right to regulate what can be done with this knowledge, yeah. you know, around the world, you know. And when, you, when you're saying the, the human brain interface uh, uh, concept, concept, you said? Yeah. Um, that's more than connecting therapists or patients. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. What people are thinking there is totally, I mean, I mean, it's totally, for me, unethical, you know. What, what, they, what are they thinking of? Because what well, they're thinking about implanting soldiers with 
electrodes to record brain activity that can be used to control guns or weapons or whatever. I don't know the details because I refuse to even listen to the details. But uh, this is a debate that has to be done among scientists and society, not only among neuroscientists, yes. So you, you mean you create not an extra, extra, uh, extra skeleton, but you put it inside in a way? No, no, you get signals from the brain to control a machine gun or a mass missile launching device yeah. or God knows what, I don't know. Or an exoskeleton for a soldier to, to, to go to war. Yeah. And I don't, that's not what I had in mind when I created this technology. That's, this is what I had in mind. Yeah. yeah. But when you envision, not this part, the this yeah. part answer, but when you envision a, a world where, where, where this, this, brain, uh, this, this brain net um, mm. would work, how, how far can that go? Because if you can well, yeah, that's a, what I told you, I have, at this point I don't have, I have just uh, suppositions and uh, hints. Yeah. and uh, gut feeling to describe it. I cannot tell you precisely where it could go. I, I think about, as I told you, uh, potential applications that can be beneficial to mankind and to people who are suffering from yeah. disorders or diseases. And, but I don't, I don't even think about sci-fi scenarios that are harmful. And I, no, not harmful, yeah. but also people. Yeah, well, I think that if we could communicate better, if we could find a way of communication that you know, is more natural and better, Perhaps we would figure it out that we're all the same, that we have the same fears, no matter where you come from. We have the same aspirations, we have the same desires. We're all humans, by the way. And uh, I look at you know things like the refugee crisis in in Europe, and you know perhaps by brain to brain communicating, we'd realize that we are all coming from the same place. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, the place was Africa, you know, and so. Racism, prejudice, uh, prejudice based on economic uh, differences, on, on religion, you know, all these things would disappear if we could ha somehow convince people that what goes through in our brains is the same thing, it's the same stuff. Yeah. And what our brains produce is the same. So you know. when you look in the future, brain-to-brain -brain communication will be more and more elaborate? I, I, I hope it could become more and more elaborate. In fact, uh, if you read Arthur Clarke's 3001, the last book of his uh, uh, series that he started in 2001, uh, you know, yeah, he starts the book with something called brain caps in 3001, and people communicate by brain caps, you know, in 3001. We are, you know, I, he would be happy to know that we are a thousand years earlier in getting some of this stuff to work. Of course, what he described there, I don't think will ever happen, but, uh, but it's interesting to see that uh, neuroscience can even compete with science fiction now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Elaborating on that, the last one, uh, the film Avatar came out in 2008. Yeah. And it seems now, 2015, we're already on that. Oh, I, I always wanted to ask Cameron where he got the idea, because he claims he had a dream we had published many Scientific American papers before he had that dream, I think. So I'm always w wonder what he got that idea of having a guy in a machine controlling an avatar. So, because this was out there, you know, I'll be very, very curious to ask him one where he really got the idea. Yeah. yeah. And the... Um, That's the director of the film, you know. Yeah. Cameron. But as, as far as the technical aspect is, is concerned, like... Uh, Oh no, there are many things there that are not possible, of course, yeah. and he just uh, made it up. Which is the advantage of science fiction to us, we cannot make it up. Yeah, but when you, when you really work, elaborate on what you are doing, and what, what other neuroscientists are doing, really working on the frontier of knowledge in that sense, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, uh, it's unimaginable what is possible when it works. Yeah, when, when, when you work. the, as I tell my students always, imagination is always the limit here. Yeah. We are in these labs, we are not here to do the mundane or the incremental things. We are, we are here to push the limit yeah. of neuroscience. So the imagination is the only limit when, when, when it's... Yeah, and this... When, when you look at the possibilities. Yes, right? but of course the time scale is not tomorrow, right? But uh, I like to work with people that likes that deal. You know, the deal of thinking far ahead yeah. and trying to make it happen.